Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, again. Um, this time um, here, I'd like to cover today uh, two subjects. The first one is about um, analysis of uh, racing statistics 2011 and has the first half of 2012. And the second part is about uh, a new world of post-market capitalism. So let me start with uh, the racing statistics in 2011. And the key word of describing racing industry in 2011 is um, Euro crisis. So industry was still under a lot of pressure after the worldwide financial crisis started in 2008 in the US. But to make the matter worse, another financial crisis was triggered in Europe and it has given us a further negative impact. First, let me show you the, the number of falls. <laughs> the number of celebrated falls in 2011 was ex approximately 103,000, another sharp decline by 5.1% from the year before, and it reflects more than 13% decline compared with the 2008, a 13% decline in three years. Main factor of 2011 decline was due to a smaller production in the United States and Australia, two biggest celebrated producing countries in the world, which represent almost 40% of the world production combined. The United States reduced by 2,900 falls and 1,300 decline in Australia. It was a good sign that Ireland, the fourth biggest breeding country, has finally bottomed out in terms of the number of falls. Next, number of races and prize money. The number of flat and jump races in 2011 was reduced to 162,300, and this decline was two years in a row, but the rate of decline was only less than 1%, and we could say it was almost flat from the year before. On the other hand, the total amount of prize money stood at 2.94 billion euros, increased by 2.6% from the previous year, but the increase was partly affected by another depreciation of euro against other currencies. When the figure was recalculated with the exchange rate of the, the previous year, it would show merely an increase of 0.4%. Some Euro European countries, Cyprus, Greece, and Slovakia, showed a double-digit decline in amount of price money. Let me go on to the betting turnover. Total amount of betting turnover in 2011 was almost 90 billion euros, and it increased by 1.9% from the previous year. And this was also partly affected by the, the value depreciation of euro. When it was recalculated with the exchange rate of the previous year, it would show a decline of 1.2%. The nominal growth was 1.9, but uh, the actual growth was minus 1.2%. Some European countries had been severely affected by the Euro crisis, and several countries in the region showed a double-digit decline. Cyprus, Czech Republic, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Slovakia. Japan, the biggest begging turnover in the world, representing almost 30% of the world betting figure decreased by another 5.7% due to a major earthquake and the nuclear accident in March, as well as an ongoing slump of economic activities. Now let me go on to some racing data in the first half of 2012. I would like to show you the evolution of betting turnover as well as some wholesale figures during the period. So let me start with the uh, betting turnover. 
it could show you several numbers only because it is very hard to collect turnover figures in the middle of the year, and it is also not realistic to read something out of the limited information. So I'd like to show you the just numbers. What we could understand is there are regional differences. Now the sales figures in 2012. Here are sales data from eight breeding countries, and they represent more than 70% of the world production. As you can see, there were sharp declines in 2009 after the financial crisis, and finally, we could see some signs of recovery this year, especially Ireland and Japan. But we have to be very vigilant because of the rate of recovery was small, and some countries are showing downward trend. In a nutshell, we are still surely under a pressure of world economic crises. And also, we could see some regional differences. Generally speaking, there is an ongo ongoing trend that Asian countries have been increasing their shares in all racing sectors, and it clearly reflects the current world economic trend. The racing statistics over the last several years suggest that the share of Asia is increasing, and on the other hand, the shares of Europe and America look to have come to their maturity. Now, I would like to go on to the, the next theme, very philosophical, which is about the, the world of post-market capitalism. So my question started from um, the world, the worlds of economic prosperity, looking at the situation where the most of the countries are struggling with how to recover, how to get out of the recession, and when we could achieve what we want again. And some people wondered how long should we struggle for economic prosperity. Our politicians, most of the time, make a political pledge like, I bring your economic prosperity and balanced budget, which, as far as I understand, has never happened anywhere in the world, at least in the last decade. Probably all you have already been aware why we are in this severe economic situation. So let me summarize it by looking at the history from market capitalism perspective. First of all, the character of the market capitalism is self-propagation or self reproduction, and market capitalism eventually requires taking out something which makes it possible to self-propagate. In other words, to exploit resources. Without exploitation, market ca capitalism could not be sustained. When it comes to exploitation of resources, the market capitalism has two frontiers to explore and there's a geographical and environmental. But I'm afraid that exploring those two frontiers has come to an end. The first about the geographical frontier. Since the Christopher Columbus reached to the continent in 1492, or the Industrial Revolution in 19th century, the Great Powers explored geographical frontier until the end of the Second World War in 1945. But since then, many colonized countries became independent, and the geographical frontier for the great powers has come to an end. Many countries became independent after the Second World War. Next, about the uh, environmental frontier. A recent rising awareness towards maintaining our environment is main reason, and this made it difficult to exploit national resources out of proportion. And also, exploring the environmental frontier has also come to an end with the loss of geographical frontiers. 
Terms of trade between the great powers and the colonites have started to change in favor of the latter, and eventually it led to the end of the domination of natural resources by the great powers. If, may, if I may describe the situation in a straightforward manner, the counterattacks from emerging countries against the great powers have started. As you can see, two major frontiers for the market capitalism have to come to an end. The market capitalism could have been reviewed in earlier stage, but then another frontier was invented, which was a financial frontier. This financial frontier is equipped with um, highly sophisticated financial engineering, and the millions of unreliable financial products have been sold to all over the world, something like so-called subprime loans, and inflated capital travels around the world without limitation. The size of the so-called homeless money is set around 40 to 50 trillion US dollars, and it surely exceeds the size of the real economy by a couple of times. Some representatives in here in this room probably could not forget the nightmare after the Lehman Brothers, one of the fund managing companies in the United States, went bankrupt in 2008. We have experienced a real good economy prosperity for the several years after the millennium, which mainly created by the financial frontier, in other words, by the inflated virtual economy. And um, now you know that the financial frontier still exists, but in practice, it has come to an end. Now that those three frontiers, geographical and environmental and financial, which enable to have broad economic prosperity, have been lost, and what government had to do was to make up for loss of their frontiers for the sake of economic prosperity. And now, as you can see, governments are issuing out of proportional, proportional national bond and allowing huge budget deficit for the sake of keeping up economy. In any cases, most of the government are struggling with the current financial crisis, and sooner or later, they have no choice but to cut back on some social benefits. As a consequence, redistribution of wealth, especially to the lower end of the society, has become insufficient, and the disparity of wealth between haves and have-nots will get wider and bigger. It's so-called bipolarization. One of the examples is Occupy Wall Street, which started almost a year ago in the United States. And people are complaining about the disparity of wealth, the rich of 1%, and the poor of 99%. In most cases, younger generations are 90-90% side, and the uh, unemployment rates are much worse than those of seniors. Look at the uh, unemployment rate of the EU countries. According to the, the data of International Labor Organization, the unemployment rate in the EU, EU 27 countries in April 2012 was 10.3%, and the unemployment rate under 25 years old, 22.4%. And when it comes to Spain and Greece, Greek, the unemployment rate under 25 years old exceeded 50%. And we are talking about how to attract younger generations to racing. What a conundrum. As I made a presentation last year, population demography means a lot to a performance of economy by taking Japan uh, as an example. And the number of spending population is a key for economic prosper prosperity. The number of spending population in Japan has hit a plateau in 1997, and our economy has grown little since. And that China will hit a plateau in terms of spending population by 2015. And I also would like to tell you that, according to the study by the United Nations, a so-called demographic window 
where a period of spending population growth is expected has already come to an end in Europe. And the United States will end its demographic window in 2015. Yes, the greater powers have already hit a plateau or hit a plateau soon, and Japan is just 15 years ahead of you. Welcome to this world. I understand we tend not to want to look at an inconvenient truth, but all data indicate something, and also data is consequence of just some phenomena, and we need to see forces at work. And those forces are at the end of three frontiers, geographical, environmental, and financial, which has driven the market capitalism so far. So I'm afraid I could not go so far as to say what kind of world will we be in or what kind of ism will come into play in the new world of post-market capitalism. But I, I could at least show you a couple of ways how we could adapt ourselves to this changing environment. The first, quality versus quantity. I think it's about time to think about this quite fundamental principle in a serious manner. I know that this quality versus quantity issue have been said, told, and discussed. But I'm afraid it has not been sufficiently implemented. When we talk about quality of raising, our principal purpose as raising authority is to carry out a quality control of raising. If we do not, do not care about quality control, our customers will be away from raising to other major activities. Nowadays, thanks to the development of information technology, our customers easily differentiate what is real and what is just superficial. Take football for example. Why the Premier League in Britain so popular? It is because customers know it has international quality. Why the NBA basketball in the United States is so popular? The same reason. It is extremely important to control the quality of races, especially black type races, and all of us in this room need to face this issue squarely. When it's come to quality of races, horses run, running under medication issue is also extremely crucial. We know that some of our friends here today are fighting day-to-day -day battle against drug issues. Please be assured that the Federation is here to stay, assist you. Another example is uh, the number of races. As I have shown the figure to you, 162,000 races have been organized in 2011, and I could not say this number is too big or too small. But you may need to look into this number from outside in rather than inside out, which means the customer's perspective rather than organizer's perspective. Do you know how many races your customers would bet per day in average in your country? The number is surely different from individual country. But in Japan, it's about eight races out of 28. Of course, some customers have or bet all races, but average is just out of 28 races. In Japan, almost 60% of betting is done through online, and it will be easier for customers to bet as many races as possible. But even under this optimistic circumstance, just out of eight out of 20 races per day is the reality. Next example is betting turnover. Betting turnover it, itself is very good, 
but we also would need to take care of more about a bottom line or net income. When we talk about each other, about uh, the situation of our countries, we sometimes quote just betting turnover. But in the, the world of post-market capitalism, we might need to talk about more about the profit rather than just the volume sales. Efficiency is going to be a key word. When it's come to quality, it's not hard to quantity, it's not hard to imagine, it's just um, about volume. When, but it, when it comes to a quality, it means a lot. And your quality and my quality could not be the same. For smaller or developing countries, your quality could stay somewhere different, not in the same place as bigger countries. For example, you could be in a situation where there will be no further development expected. In that case, a policy of not expecting too much and maintain the, your territory at all costs could be your quality in order to maintain your bottom line. A totally different policy must be implemented between expansion and maintenance, even though those bottom lines are the same as a result. Quality would be a key word in the world of post-market capitalism. Another important aspect would be do the right thing, simply because it is the right thing to do. In the world of market capitalism, values are just determined by markets. And things cannot be exchanged in market do not have values. As you understand, there are a lot of valuable things which cannot be exchanged in the market. For example, household chores. Most of the cases, the value of doing household chores could not be exchanged in the market, but it surely has a value, and without it, we could easily imagine the outcome of it. Do you sometimes say thank you to your partners? Uh, I do. Uh, sometimes forget, but I try from time to time. I take charity activities for another example. A philosophy of charity activities is just to gi give, and they would be said thank you in return. And those words of appreciation would motivate people and drive the system. The words of appreciation cannot be valued in any conventional markets or at all. Now I'd like to show you some good example of those do the right thing activities in our industry. The first in the United States, they established Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance for retired horses this year. A real tough issue for our industry, but they bravely face this issue squarely. Vice Chairman, in Hong Kong, one of the main business categories of the Hong Kong Jockey Club is charities and community. This is just a one of the many examples of implementations for the community. Here says about three hours, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Can you imagine a world where just horse racing prospers and whole community suffers? Absolutely not. In France, the France girl is planning a new grandstand at the launch and race course. For its implementation, one of the main concepts is to maintain the surrounding natural environment. As uh, the race course is located in the middle of the Vaud Blonde, which is woods of Blonde, cohabitation with the environment is extremely important. Those are the good examples you could follow and I would like to repeat the, the point I want to make again. Do the right thing because it is the right thing to do. I have touched on the importance of the quality and do the right thing in, in coming new world. I understand that the market capitalism will surely here to stay with us down the road as a major or main player. But since it has shown us, us its limitation and its true colors, it is a matter of when, not if, a new world would come into play.
together with the market capitalism. And it is us to decide in which direction we should go and what philosophy we should bear in coming a new environment. Our role as racing authority is safeguard the industry at all costs on the last line. And in, in this sense, our role would be like a goalkeeper rather than a forward. We need to carefully watch the match from overview with focused eyes and need to understand the forces at work. As we are the last defense on the line, and that is the very reason why we would need to bear a sublime ideology and philosophy, especially in the world of the post-market capitalism. Thank you.